Swan Movie Review. Nina is a perfectionist, a ballerina at the, don't remember what the theater is called, but it's a, an important one. And she badly wants the lead as the Swan Queen in Swan Lake, the famous play. But the instructor doesn't feel like she can quite play both roles because it requires both one that is pure and one that is more uninhibited. And while she's got the pure down, she can't quite do the more uninhibited one. But he does give her a chance, and she gradually tries to give in to the inhibition, if that made sense. And it affects her. And that's all I'm going to tell you about the plot. Before I start praising this film, and I will, I should probably just make it clear I'm not into ballet at all. I'm not even into dancing. Period. And it's not like this has made a ballet fan out of me. But at no point during this did I look at the ballet. And there is a fair amount of dancing in this film. At no point did I look at it and feel in any way like the movie was wasting my time at all. I should probably start with the casting and the acting. Portman is pitch perfect. I'm not sure it's going to be a big surprise that she does incredibly well as the pure Nina, the image of purity. But, and this really isn't a spoiler, she, there is a version of Nina that is more dark and she performs perfectly as that as well. We fear the dark half. And Myla Kunis, if that's how you pronounce it, I hope I'm not hurting anyone's feelings here, but from my experience, she's not exactly that great of an actress. But she gets it perfectly right here. I think the casting is a big part of it. In the part of both of them. I don't think that either of them could have handled the other's role quite as well. And that's in spite of the fact that Portman is a pretty good actress when she's just given good material. And yes, by that I am saying that, you know, the fault of the Star Wars prequels was on George Lucas's writing. Yeah, that's pretty much a fact, so... Kunis perfectly embodies the lack of inhibition. And while you can sense that Portman is frightened by Kunis, you can also tell there's a bit of an attraction to it. She can't quite claim that it isn't just a little bit exciting. And the mother, I do not know the actress's name, and I feel bad about that because she did fantastic. When you see Nina's mother, you know why Nina is who she is. You know why she's such a perfectionist. 
the mother has, you know, she's the stiff upper lip wanting her offspring to do well. She's basically living vicariously through Nina. All three of these could so easily be such stereotypes, such cliche-ridden, superficially done characters, and they're not. Not even a little bit. You understand all three. And though you may not always like all three and quite agree with what they're doing, you always believe it. Vincent Cassell as the instructor, Thomas, it's Thomas, but he's French, so drop the S. Fantastic. The, the, the sheer passion. I don't know if Cassell has any kind of past with dancing, much less ballet. I don't know exactly where what he drew on to get that kind of passion, that kind of fire into his movements and his eyes, but he did it. Just impeccable. And that's essentially it for the acting and the characters. And the passion nicely brings me into, in general, this is a passionate film. And in fact, downright erotic. I would say that if this does nothing for your libido, I'd have to guess you were a genetically mutated, asexual being that just looks a lot like a human being. Just putting that out there. The sexuality of Nina becomes a sort of symbol for the inhibition, you know, because I hope this isn't shocking anyone. If you're listening to this and this is a shock to you, you're probably not old enough to handle the movie. Or mature enough, whatever. With sex, you have to let go, you know. You can't have control all of the time. And Nina being the perfectionist, she's also a bit of a control freak. Those two things kind of go together. So there is... You know, that becomes the symbol for it, and it just, it works incredibly well. There is a fair bit of eroticism and sexuality, and it is really not gratuitous at all. It's, it's quite impressive. There's also some swearing, and it's very strategically used. Excuse me, it's worth noting who swears and when in this movie. And I have to say some about the technical approach also. I have not yet watched The Fountain. I know. I will now. What, what can I say? I, I really do enjoy both Pi and Requiem for a Dream. And yes, Requiem for a Dream is manipulative, so, you know. I was really impressed with Aronofsky in this yet again. The man really knows how to deal with the whole psychological, you know, especially matters of, like, obsession, you know. He and Christopher Nolan, I don't know who they've dealt with in their personal life who was really obsessed, but they just, they both love doing movies about that. The, the typical traits, the trademarks of Aronofsky are present here. We get grotesque, brutal, gruesome sights and sounds. I'm not going to give any of them away. And 
the veritable transformation is rather well handled. It's the sort of thing that could very easily be silly and over the top, and it really isn't. The score by Clint Mansell, also from Requiem for a Dream, incredible. The cinematography is just fantastic. There's this scene at a dance club, and just you feel like you're there. You know, you feel like you are there dancing with them, you know, inebriated, too inebriated to understand the meaning of the word inebriated. And just the, the way it's filmed, just fantastic. There's a scene near the end, but I'm not going to give it away in this video. It's also worth noting, and maybe this is just you know, kind of geeky, because I'm a, an aficionado of film myself, but it is worth noting just how many reflective surfaces are in many of the scenes, and anyone who's ever tried to film something with reflective surfaces and light it properly, and the whole nine yards, you know just how much of a hassle that is. Because reflective surfaces reflect everything. And... For anyone else who walk into this knowing nothing at all about ballet, you can appreciate the visual. I did not expect to be able to do so. I mean, when it comes to action and martial arts, I love well-done choreography. But dancing? Don't anybody hit me with that martial arts is like dancing BS. No, I won't hear any of it. But I, I got into it. I enjoyed the heck out of this. And... Also, if you do not know the plot of Swan Lake, I walked into this not knowing it. They describe it very early on, like the first 20 minutes or so. They basically, you know, give you a brief summary of it, so you'll know what it's supposed to be. And later they give a little bit of an analysis of some of it also. And that's basically what I have to say about Black Swan. Not everyone will enjoy it, but if you like Aronofsky, if you've liked Pi, you know, regardless of what fruit it's made of, and or if you liked Requiem for a Dream, if you like that style, you will like this movie. It's less... It's, it's more towards the realistic than those two, I would say. But it is still about, you know, psycho psychological thriller, kind of, with, you know, manifestations of, you know, what's in the mind. You know, metaphors, very... somehow both shown relatively directly and yet handled delicately somehow. Um, yeah, if you like psychological thriller drama or Natalie Portman or the overall concept, the whole thing of, you know, the dark side of everyone, you know, keeping that in check, that whole thing, you have to watch this movie. You just have to. So, that was my review of Black Swan. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.